Hi guys, so this is a quick recording just to make sure that you're happy with the material that we would have covered um, if we were able to continue with our lecture today. I ran a little bit over time. This section is all about responsibilities and code of ethics and I mentioned that this um, and the code that we work under is developed by the APS, the Australian Psychological Society, and it's adopted by all registered psychologists. It's a must for them, but it's also a really good code to use for all other graduates. The first principle that you um, look at is generally respect and rights uh, for the dignity of people and peoples. And I'll just give you a second, uh, feel free to pause during these recordings if you want to read the text that I have on the slides. Respect is obviously a huge part of psychological practice with clients but also with other practitioners um, from the profession of psychology and more broadly. Um, respect for rights means not just people's legal rights but also their human rights and their moral rights and dignity of all people and peoples. Um, when we talk about respect or when we think about respect there's quite a few things that um, could be applied under this umbrella. So there's an awareness and appreciation of difference, um, there's respect expressed in communications and conduct, there's respect in disputes and disagreement, uh, in research which is a very interesting principle and Doug will talk to you about that in his lecture. Respect around cultural ethnicity, sexuality, gender, disability, religion, age and others and, and there's actually a part in the code that says or any other characteristics um, that may be considered appropriate. Special competencies, so respect for the competencies within the profession and outside of it that some may hold and also legal and moral rights. So it's quite a broad principle of respect. It's the very first one that comes up in the code. It's really important for you to be aware of um, and I guess for you to consider when you're working in your groups and when you're um, starting to train with clients. The second part of respect um, that I wanted to talk about was how we might brief a client in therapy and why res how respect would be enacted and why it's important. The first um, thing to consider is informed consent. Informed consent means that somebody has a really good clear idea of what to expect, what's going to go on in therapy or in research, um, what they'll be asked to do, how long it will take, the nature of the task that they might be asked to do, any expected risks, any expected benefits, how they might be compensated, if there is any compensation offered. All of that is outlined before they provide any consent to continue. And so this is important in research and you'll hear Doug talk a lot about it in his research lecture. But informed consent is also important to clients. So when we talk about therapies and one-on-one -on -one contact with clients, we're always including a session about um, explaining the therapies we're using, explaining the evidence behind them, describing what might go on in a session, how they might feel about that, explaining their rights to feel comfortable and to you know, let us know if things are getting too much. All of that is described in that first session and they provide consent after they're fully informed. The other principles here are privacy and confidentiality. Um, Doug will talk a little bit more about these again, but privacy, um, generally psychologists do not talk about their clients in more broad spectrums or in, in more broad conversation. Um, all of the client's personal details are kept confidential they're not given out freely or distributed to mailing lists or anything like that. Um, so all of the records are stored in ways that are appropriate. So it might be password protected files, it might be um, locked filing cabinets that can only be accessed by the psychologist. Um, confidentiality means that nothing would be discussed any further, so you can't go home and debrief freely with your partner or anything like that. Um, the confidentiality also, there's a flip side of that, it's appropriate disclosure. This uh, represents the times when you might break confidentiality with a client. Um, there's a few times when it is appropriate to disclose information. One of these is when the client, when it's clear that the client may harm themselves in the immediate future. You have a responsibility and a duty of care to protect them and often getting help means breaking that confidentiality, it may be taking them to hospital or something um, like that. The second time is when it's clear that they are intending to harm someone else. Um, 
if the person's identifiable, it might be about notifying the person, it may be about um, getting the person to hospital again, getting them support, um, it may include talking to police. It's, um, it's a form of breaking confidentiality um, that is designed to protect both the client and anyone else that they might cause harm to. The final um, area of appropriate disclosure that I'll talk about is quite it's a little bit of a new one a lot of the time we were already doing this but it's now part of our registration psychologists are now required to consult with other psychologists about their client load and the work that they're doing it's called peer consultation and generally people are required to do at least 10 hours a year of peer consultation where they're talking about their own practice with somebody else um, you tend to get advice or maybe the psychologist asks you a lot of questions that get you thinking about the case. It's to help you make sure that you're delivering the best service and also that you're working within um, a good code of ethics and you're adhering to that strongly. So in that case you do um, disclose some of your client's information. Sometimes, um, and in fact almost all the time, this would involve not disclosing any um, personal identifying information. So although you're talking about a client and the other person is bound by confidentiality to keep it private, um, they may not know which individual person that you're talking about, all that sort of thing. Um, as much as possible, you protect the identity of the client. Okay, so that's generally the broad areas of respect. And I think you probably agree that what the code means by respect is a little bit broader than our everyday um, language and terminology. Propriety. So propriety is probably not a word that many of us use just in our general language. Some of us might. It's the state or quality of conforming to conventionally accepted standards of behaviour or morals. Um, it's the details or rules of behaviour that are considered correct. And this is really propriety within the profession of psychology. So psychologists, we talked a lot about disclosing what you're competent to practice in and you know the kinds of clients that you might work with. That's a big part of propriety. Um, they provide services to benefit, not to harm. That's a key principle of psychology. Psychologists seek to protect the interests of people and people whom they work with, um, with whom they work, sorry. Uh, their welfare of clients and the public and the standing of the profession take precedence over a psychologist's self-interest. So here a big question is, would you be prepared to do something that is in the interest of the profession even if it's quite harmful or detrimental to your own self-interest? Um, I guess there's also here a sense of decency, suitability or fitness to practice. So psychologists are also responsible for being um, well enough to practice, to being competent in a number of ways. They need to work within those competencies. They need to engage in professional supervision. So the peer mentoring is part of it, but you're also required to do um, quite a few hours of training each year and engage in workshops or conferences that will help keep your skills up to date. There's monitoring of your own professional functioning, maintaining professional records, taking professional responsibility, avoiding multiple relationships. Um, this is where maybe you have a friendship or something or you're aware of a, somebody in the community and then you take them on as a client. So avoiding that at, at um, most costs. The um, proviso here is probably the most common one is in a rural situation. If you were uh, in a community of a couple of hundred people, it's not likely that you'll be able to avoid all multiple relationships. Um, but there are some key ones that you never would break. I mean, for a close friend, you never would engage them as a client. Um, that would be taking on a level of power over them that's completely inappropriate. Um, and also dealing adequately with conflicting demands. So it is a psychologist's responsibility. Um, one of the levels is sort of the demands on yourself. It's a psychologist's responsibility to take care of yourself, to make sure that um, you're able and you're prepared to work in the capacity um, that you're working in. Also, if you're hired as an organisational psych and you've got one client who um, really is suffering in the current work situation but the organisation doesn't want to change that particular way of working, how do you balance? Who is your real client there? Is it the person sitting in front of you um, telling you how upset or how much this is affecting them? Or is it the organisation that's paying your, your bills? So. I think there's a lot of situations where you might have multiple 
layers of clients in a way and you have to deal with conflicting demands from the organization and from the people that you're working face to face with the last principle that the ethics code talks about is integrity it's the concept of consistency of actions values methods measures principles expectations and outcomes the and here is just a little a throwaway comment can be regarded as the opposite of hypocrisy um, integrity in the code this is their description that psychologists recognize the knowledge of the discipline of psychology their professional standing and the information they gather does put them in a position of power and trust within the community and that this means they must honor this position of trust um, psychologists keep faith with the nature and the intentions of their professional relationships and act um, with honesty in their conduct integrity um, does cover quite a range of activities including communications like advertising your business or, or advertising yourself conduct conflicts of interest under authorship and being honest about who's contributed to research and also financial arrangements so integrity uh, again just like respect covers a lot of different areas maybe not the ones that we would simply mention in um, more conversational language also a large area of the profession so a couple of uh, key questions that you might like to ask yourself out um, at the end of this little module on ethics is if you had a client who needed to negotiate maybe a cheaper rate would you be able to do it is it ethical can you accept a gift from a client would that be ethical would how would that go against the principles of propriety and integrity um, maybe another question is if someone discloses child sexual assault in their past is that something that you would have to break confidentiality to disclose if someone disclosed about um, suspected child sexual assault in their family happening currently would that be something that you would disclose and what would you do if you had a client who said actually I have had thoughts about suicide from time to time you know these kind of um, I guess comments from your client how would you respond what is the most appropriate and ethical response what ought you do all right so I'll leave it there um, I will put up a couple of questions and answers um, with regards to this stuff I've also gone through the quiz responses and I'll make sure that I add all of the unique questions um, to the FAQs with a little bit of an answer there too thanks guys for listening and I'll see you next week